Court of Appeal in the 4th, 5th District, 5th uh, District of the State of Florida is now in session. The Honorable James A. Edwards, Judge Presiding. All persons having business before this court draw near. Give attention and you will be heard. May God save the United States of America, the State of Florida, and this Honorable Court. Please be seated. Good morning and welcome to a session of oral arguments. And we have uh, great events today, as our marshal said. I'm Judge Jim Edwards. Uh, to my left is Judge Scott Makar, formerly of the First District Court, and now a firmly ensconced <laughs> member of our court. This is his first in-person oral argument at the court. And to my right is Judge Kerry Evander, and I hate to report that this is his last day of oral arguments here at the court because he's going to be leaving us at the end of February. And we thank him for all his service at all levels of the court that he's been. So, with all the announcements out of the way, our first case today is 213137, uh, Baker Family Chiropractic versus Liberty Mutual. Each side will have 20 minutes. Typically, we go with five minutes rebuttal. If you want anything different, just let us know and we'll be happy to change that around. I know y'all are experienced at this, but sometimes people get a little confused. You do have a clock on the podium. There are lights. When it gets to yellow for the appellant, you're into your rebuttal time. The amount on the clock that's shown, that's it. There's not like an extra five minutes hanging around somewhere. So sometimes people get a little confused. We don't want to have that happen. Uh, if you've got anything that might make noise, like a telephone, put it on vibrate or silent or, you know, go crazy and turn it all the way off. But with that, we're ready to proceed, counsel. Thank you, Your Honors, and it is a pleasure to uh, argue in front of Judge McCarr for your first time here. Glad you're here, and uh, Judge Evander, we will miss you. My name is William England, and if it pleases the court, I would like to reserve four minutes for rebuttal. All right. Here we have an issue with regards to entitlement and interpretation of Florida Statute 627.428. There are three reasons, three independent reasons why the trial court should be reversed. Specifically, the first one is purely contractual interpretation. Under 428, plaintiff prevailed in the, in the underlying action, enforced the terms of the insurance policy, obtained insurance uh, proceeds in the form of additional interest owed under the contract of insurance. This is separate and independent from the no-fault statute. The second basis is the trial court misinterpreted and misapplied the no-fault statute and uh, erroneously relied upon the fourth DCA, which was clearly, clearly distinguishable and we will address. The third basis is the trial court upon this, uh, the initial appeal being dismissed, misinterpreted and misapplied the mandate of this court. Specifically- Let me ask you about that issue. Um, the trial judge had awarded fees but had not determined the amount. That is correct. Therefore, it would appear that we would have no jurisdiction to even address the issue of whether there was entitlement. So I'm not sure how we could have agreed with the judge on entitlement or disagreed with the judge on entitlement since we lack jurisdiction. So how would that create a mandate or law of the case? Upon uh, the mandate from the initial dismissal of the initial appeal, uh, this court granted our motion for appellate attorney's fees condition upon it going back down to the trial level and the trial level determining entitlement for the appeal. That, that was the clear language of the order of dismissal, adopting the Liberty Mutual's dismissal of the initial appeal. And so the trial court, uh, which was a, su a secondary judge rotated in, interpreted that as you want them to interpret everything, to go back. So she, she interpreted well, I, that. I think what Judge Evander was saying and what seems clear to me, the issue of entitlement of attorney's fees was not a final order after the first case in terms of appellate review. Yes, sir. So, it could not have come up to our court for review. If somebody had tried to raise that and argue that, we would have said it's premature. We don't look at entitlement without an amount. If it's not a final order, it kind of sounds like it's an interlocutory order that might be revisited and a suggestion you might want to spend your time on other issues. Absolutely, Your Honor. I appreciate that. Um, so 
With regards to the facts of this case, and, and I understand you know the facts very well, there's just important aspects I think we all should understand that are indisputable and would result in the law of the case, specifically that the initial final judgment found that plaintiff was enforcing the terms of the policy, uh, that the policy required prompt payment of PIP benefits, that failure to do so would include interest, the policy did not specify an interest rate, so therefore the court looked to Florida Statute 687.01, which sets forth that when an interest rate is not specified within a contract of insurance, you go with Florida Statute 5503 in order to interpret that. That is purely contractual. We enforce the terms of the policy, and that's going to be important because your sister court in the 4th DCA uh, stated that when they, when they provided their analysis in 2022 uh, on a similar matter, while this was pending up on appeal, they clearly specified that the court's review was limited just to statute in that aspect. And that was in Liberty Mutual Insurance Company versus Pan Am Diagnostic. And specifically, the fourth DCA stated that we're under de novo review, but we're looking at 428 which means we have to apply the clear language of the statute. The clear language of the statute says that when an insured or an assignee of the insured is forced to file suit in order to enforce the terms of the policy and they prevail, they get a judgment or decree, the court shall award fees and costs. However, in the Liberty Mutual case in Pan Am Diagnostic in the 4th DCA, the 4th DCA went on to state that the provider has not shown that there is an entitlement to interest on the late payment of PIP benefits grounded upon any policy or contractual provision, right? That's not our case, is it? That is not our case. That is the apples and- stipulation of the parties before the first trial was the sole issue for the court to resolve was whether the interest due and paid on 422 2019 was correct and proper under the policy of insurance in Florida law, right? Absolutely. And then throughout the judgment, the first judgment, the trial judge talks about contract and policy and concludes ultimately that under three separate statutes and the policy, it was not correctly paid, right? Exactly, Your Honor. Well, so it was, it's, it's the, that was an issue that was decided. That was an issue that was appealable. It was appealed and Liberty Mutual dismissed the appeal, correct? That is correct, Your Honor. Okay, so that could be law of the case. That, that is exactly what our position is, because upon remand, after the dismissal of the appeal, the subsequent judge, in their analysis and their denial of entitlement, focused solely on statutory entitlement, focused solely on the no-fault statute, and completely ignored the law of the case when it comes to the fact that we correctly, properly, and lawfully enforce the terms of the policy. And let me ask you about the statutes. Under 627-736, there are like two 30-day safe harbor times. If the, the claim is due, meaning the benefit is due within 30 days of receipt of the initial submission of the claim to the insurer, correct? Yes, Your Honor. All right, if they pay it then, everything's fine. If they don't pay it then, once it's overdue, the insured or the assignee in this case can send a demand letter, which was done in this case, yes, Your saying Honor. you're $168 short. If they pay, Everything, again, within the 30 days provided by statute, you can't sue them at all for anything, correct? You cannot, or at the very least, you would not be entitled to fees. Well, they're, they're, if, you, if they pay everything, you can't sue them for anything. Yes, Your Honor. If they pay the attorneys, if they pay the claim, and claim is separate from interest, penalties, and postage, if they pay the claim within that 30 days, you're not entitled to attorney's fees, correct? That is correct, Your Honor. Okay. And, and that's where we are here. They didn't pay within the third, they, they short paid the $168. A demand letter was sent out saying you owe us $168 plus unspecified interest. They didn't pay within the 30 days, did they? No, they waited 41 days. So they're not within the safe harbor provision of that's provided by 10D, correct? That is absolutely correct. And that takes me on to my second point. Uh, which was the trial court incorrectly interpreted and misapplied the no-fault statute. Well, me, before you get to that point. Yes, Your Honor. So the 168, there's a demand letter that says you're late, 168 plus interest. So they paid the, uns, the 168 plus some amount of interest. They did. All right. And 
whether they calculated right or wrong, that's been determined. But they, let's say they paid $6 and it should have been $750. Is there anything in the record that before you filed suit for the dollar forty-eight that um, that there was a demand saying you miscalculated by dollar forty-eight? The record uh, reflects the demand letter. The record reflects the untimely payment, and it also includes the stipulation uh, of the parties that narrowed the issue solely to uh, whether or not the insurer properly paid interest owed under the policy and the statute. So by narrowing that legal issue down to that one statement, the Liberty has waived the argument as to needing a, su a supplemental demand. And there's no statutory basis to send a second demand or send more than one. They already had two bites at the apple. Um, and that's the reason why the statute holds that way and is phrased that way. Right. So the answer to my question is no? No, there's Your There's nothing on the record? No, there's nothing on the record other than the waiver of that argument by Liberty at the trial level. Do you think we should encourage that type of uh, action by, by lawyers where you have a dollar in dispute, a dollar forty-eight, and instead of saying you're a dollar short, you just file suit? Your Honor, the purpose, uh, it's not encouraging greedy lawyers. I, I respectfully submit that it's not encouraging greedy lawyers that the uh, purpose- If you had sent the demand letter and they paid, we wouldn't be here, right? Or maybe we would, yes. I don't know. Yes, um, and understanding that when we sent the bill, they had a chance, like, like Judge Edwards hit on. Right, they but, they, a, but they calculated the interest wrong. They did, and entitlement- so, Oh, I'm sorry, Your Honor. What if they were a penny off and you didn't ask for the penny? The same result, right? If we did not ask for it, yes. However, in this particular aspect, our demand letter did ask that they calculate the interest pursuant to 5503, right. which is the statutory right. basis. And the reason why we could not specify an interest rate is because... You don't know exactly what day they're going to pay it. Exactly. Right. You know, if they, if they had paid 30 days after, but we only calculated for 20 days, then the demand letter could arguably be inaccurate. But under your argument, if they calculated that it was $6.01 and it should have been $6.02, you could immediately file suit and seek attorney's fees. As long as they do not pay within the 30 days or announce that they're going to pay in full within 30 days, if it's an instance like this where they waited 41 after the second bite of the apple, then yes, they, would, they have breached the policy if their policy requires them to pay the interest. Right, and so they've paid it late. They've responded to your demand letter by paying the $168 and by paying interest, but they're, if they're a penny off on, on the calculation, it's your position that you could then immediately sue and seek attorney's fees. I always try not to immediately sue, but yes, arguably under the law, that could happen. Let me ask you this, counsel. Under 627-736-10A, which is the demand letter provision, it says, as a condition preceding to filing any action for benefits under this section, you must make a demand. Yes. Is interest truly a benefit? Interest is a contractual proceed. So this is where we get into the second prong of the argument where the court. Look at, if you look at what the fourth DCA did, they broke down benefits as health care, disability, and others, I know it was lost wages, but three, or death benefit, I guess. There's three distinct benefits. Interest is something other than the benefit or the overdue claim, isn't it? I don't believe it is, because with the swift inversion- It's not, if it is a benefit, then you had to send a demand letter. If it's not a benefit, then you're okay, right? That is correct, Your Honor. And so when looking at it, uh, and the fourth DCA's analysis, when they were looking at subsection eight, which states that uh, 428 and the offer of judgment statute apply to any dispute, any dispute between Florida Statute 627-730 and 627-7405. They then went to 731 to look at the purpose of the statute, which is what your question is hitting on. However, where it's our position that the fourth erred is that it improperly nullified subparagraph eight. It added limitation language where the legislature did not draft limitation language. And explicitly, under subparagraph eight, it looks to any dispute, any, that is clear language. And what is within that range? Subsection 4D of the no-fault statute. Subsection 4D does include interest. So 
If you look at the plain language of the statute saying it applies to any dispute and 4D falls within that range of where it applies, then to say that it only applies to benefits or specifically labeled benefits is erroneously limiting the language of the statute, which the legislature knew what they were writing and they chose not to put that limitation in. They only added two exceptions. The subparagraph 15, which is res judicata, which does not apply here, and subparagraph 10, which Your Honor was hitting on, where if they pay within 30 days or state that they're going to pay in full within 30 days, then you cannot sue them. So there's only two exceptions that are clearly delineated within subparagraph 8, and the fourth added another. That is where, that is where we, uh, hold or we are asking this court to reverse the trial court on because the trial court upon going back down relied upon that limitation. In the, in the first trial, Liberty Mutual didn't say, oops, our bad, we underpaid you a penny. They fought it, they litigated it, correct? They did. And, and then after that, after they lost at trial, they then took it up on appeal to the point of they filed their initial brief, you filed your answer brief, and then they dismissed the appeal. Absolutely. So and this was not, this was not sorry we made a mistake, and I understand that sorry we made a mistake could have a thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollar price tag with it, but we've got to interpret the statute as it's written, don't we? Exactly as it's written. Well, which can is we also tell from the record whether they were contesting a dollar forty eight or whether they were contesting a dollar forty eight plus attorney's fees? They were disputing both. They argued that there was a flat interest rate calculation under four uh four D and instead of going with the annualized interest rate set forth under 5503. But if they were successful on that, then they wouldn't have to argue about attorney's fees, but... If they were successful, then they would not have had to argue attorney's fees. But is there anything in the record that suggests that they wouldn't have paid the dollar 48 willingly, but for the demand for attorney's fees, or, or is that just a question that's not clear from the record? That is not clear from the record. However, as the trial attorney, I did have communication with. Don't, if it's not in the record. Okay. Don't, don't, so it's don't. not. It's not on the record. But I can tell you. I can reassure you. They wanted to fight not, over the interest. Okay. And then when it went up on appeal. Well, well, if it's not in the record, you cannot argue it. They, they did fight. They did fight over the interest, and that's why I went to summary right. judgment. That's why we. But we can't tell if they were fighting over the interest because of the attorney's fee assessment that may or may not follow afterwards. Oh yes, we cannot defer uh, or interpret their. Right. their motivations right. um, from the record. However, what we can see is that in this aspect, the insurer chose to litigate, the insurer chose to fight, the insurer chose to not pay the bill in full within the first 30 days. They were given a second bite of the apple. They chose not to comply with the statute. They violated the condition precedent that would have protected them under subparagraph 10. And then they chose to litigate, stipulate the facts, go to summary judgment, take the appeal, and then in their initial appeal brief, they argued solely the statute, that the statute and uh, statutory application of interest was incorrect. In our answer brief, we highlighted again, our argument was contract and statute, both. We went under either prong. And then once we filed our answer brief, that is when they dismissed the initial appeal. And the appeal, the initial appeal was all about the interest rate. It was. It was not about attorney's fees, was it? It was not. In fact, there was a footnote by Liberty uh, that said they cannot appeal the entitlement to fees until there's a dollar amount. And so they were waiting to see how the court ruled on the interest before they dismissed the initial appeal. And so 428, I see that I'm falling into my rebuttal time. So uh, I'll wrap Wait it up pretty say, quick. Okay, yes. Um, 428 was clear that it applies when an insurer makes a mistake. There's nothing malicious about it. It's when you mess up and you choose to fight 428 is the, what levels the playing field between the large insurance carrier and the assignees or the insureds. So I'll says Fred Lewis, right? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. I'll save the rest of my time for rebuttal. All right. Good morning, Hinda Klein here on uh, behalf of Liberty Mutual. We believe that the trial court uh, correctly found no entitlement to attorney's fees under the facts of this case. 627428, which is really the only attorney's fee statute um, that actually grants an entitlement to fees, 
requires that upon rendition of a judgment against an insurer and in favor of a, a named or omnibus insured under a policy or contract executed by the insurer, then the trial court shall award attorney's fees. Uh, we submit that that language under a policy or contract executed by an insurer is not just excess verbiage. It requires that there be a recovery under the insurance policy. Didn't and, the, in the first trial, didn't the judge look at the stipulation and see that the only issue is whether the interest was properly paid under the policy of insurance and Florida law and then in its judgment? find that it was not properly calculated under three different statutes and the policy? Well, I don't think there's any question here that the policy makes no mention whatsoever of insurance. The question to you was not that, was it? I, I understand. My that. question to you was, isn't that what the judge did? Um, respectfully, I don't think that if you look at the uh, judge's final summary judgment, that is what the court actually concludes. Um, the court goes on and on for, I don't know, six pages about what the, what the actual issue was. What's which the is final decision, though? Doesn't it say it's under three different statutes and the policy it was not correctly calculated? Correct. Hmm. Okay. That, so that you is had a judgment that said this, is a, this was due under the policy and these statutes, right? Correct, yes. Y'all appealed it. You could have contested that finding on appeal. You dismissed the appeal. We dismissed. So that we, finding is bulletproof, isn't it? Uh, respectfully, I, I don't think so because. Why not? Well, first of all, um, we dismissed the appeal because at the time all of this was going on, uh, there was a question of law as to how to calculate interest under the PIP statute. And during the pendency of the appeal, um, that issue was finally addressed. Well, and in your brief, you say you dismissed it for reasons that aren't relevant. So that's are they now relevant? No, okay. Your Honor. That I, <clears throat> I was just trying to respond to your question. Um, <clears throat> that comment, and that's what I think it was in the final summary judgment on this about under a policy uh, or contract of insurance is basically not a finding that there was anything in the four corners of the policy that referenced insurance, I mean interest, excuse me. It, it simply... Right, and, and the, the trial judge, the first trial judge could have been wrong, but the first trial judge said the court finds that plaintiff is owed $1.48 in prejudgment interest pursuant to 627-736-4D, 55.03, 687.01, and the policy of insurance for which let execution issue. That was her judgment, the court's judgment, which y'all appealed and then dismissed the appeal. So it's there forever in rock in that case. It may not have been a correct decision. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that that was necessarily correct. But that's what you have to live with in this case, don't you? Except that I, what I think that the court was referring to is the fact that the policy, uh, like the statute, talks in terms of payment being overdue if not paid within 30 days. It is only the PIP statute that talks in terms of what the penalty is, which is interest. Um, the court does not refer to any section of the policy as giving rise to an entitlement to interest. It's not I, I there. I agree with you. I, I read the policy. I had my clerk look and see if it specifically said. It, all it says is it's overdue after 30 days. Right. I, I, I totally agree with you. But the judgment you had puts it under the policy. Maybe wrong. I mean, a lot of times, it, if judges always got everything right at the trial court level, we'd be doing something else because we wouldn't have any, we would have no need to be here. They don't always get it right. If they don't get it right, your right is to take an appeal and challenge their finding. You did that, but then you dismissed it before you let this court make that decision. So that decision made for us, I think. Well, it, but here's the question, is that if we had taken it up on appeal um, and determined, hypothetically only, that there were not legitimate grounds to argue the ultimate 
decision that the judge reached, which is that you have to calculate interest on overdue benefits with changing annually. That was the be and end all of this case. If we had decided, uh, again, hypothetically, that that was not a legitimate ground for appeal and, and that it would have been frivolous, then how would it have made any sense for us to appeal the one line or the, the judge's conclusion that that was under a policy or contract of insurance? It wouldn't have changed anything whatsoever. Well, it wouldn't have the operated fourth, to reverse the judge's ruling. Some of the fourth ruling. district's cases, though, they look at whether a benefit's been paid under the policy or just under the statute. So at least the fourth DCA in one case thinks that's a big deal when you can't show it was under the contract. This judgment says it was under the contract. I mean, we can move, but we don't have to spend all your time here on this one point, but. No, but, but, but if, the, if the final judgment had said, the court finds that the plaintiff is owed a dollar forty-eight in prejudgment interest pursuant to Florida Statute fifty-five zero three, and stop there. This would be an, a non-issue. Correct. So the question is whether adding the other language, whether that created a uh, law of the case, if you would. And uh, and uh, I agree with the court, and that I guess was the point I was sort of trying to make. That was the law of the, the case requires a determination that, that that particular language was necessary to the decision. Right, and I think that if this court had uh, rendered this decision, I would argue that that language uh, was not the thrust of the case and, and was not the holding. Uh, and I think that was essentially what happened here. There would have been nothing to be gained and no legitimate argument to be raised that that language was an error, but we're not going to contest the 5503 um, conclusion of the court. There was nothing, literally nothing to appeal, if not the 5503. So we were sort of in a bind. I mean, do you go up because you think that maybe, you know, they might raise that argument to say law of the case in a subsequent argument over the attorney's fees, which at the time um, was not ripe for appeal. I, there was no way to have this uh, changed or, and frankly, no reason to have it, it changed before um, this case or this issue came up for appeal. And I think- I'm, I'm Counsel, could I ask you to clarify? Yeah. On that dismissal, did I just hear you say that there was no jurisdiction or you said, uh, what, what, and the, no, I'm we getting, didn't. We didn't believe that there was a justiciable issue after the appellate courts had determined how to calculate interest under 5503 in PIP cases. Yeah, I'm trying to focus in on the dismissal of the earlier appeal. Oh, whether that somehow establishes the law of the case. I understand. Did, did this court actually have jurisdiction to hear that appeal? Oh, absolutely, it did. Okay, oh, so but it wouldn't have had jurisdiction to hear any argument about entitlement to attorney's fees. Right, but it was all it was about the interest. Correct. Right, okay. Right. Um, because I, I'm, in my mind, I had this concept that maybe that was an entitlement judgment versus amount, and that it's typically you have to have the two at the same time, but. Correct, right. and that's, that's how we got here now. Okay. Was yeah. you, you guys weren't appealing the entitlement question from the first trial, correct? Correct, we, would, we couldn't have, right. we couldn't have. Um, and that would have been the appropriate time, I think, to I guess raised the issue about whether this arose out of a policy or contract, but right. we couldn't well, have done it. Well, so. Maybe if Liberty Mutual versus Pan Am had been around, in which the fourth DCA said, however, the provider has not shown that its entitlement to interest on the late payment of PIP benefits is grounded upon any policy or contractual provision. If you'd known that was coming, that might have affected the decision because, you know, who, who knows what a decision is going to be based on, but now that that's out there, whether it's under the policy or just statute, at least if you were in the fourth DCA, it would be kind of a big deal, wouldn't it? That's true. Okay. Uh, under under 620, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Under 627, 736, 10, you have two different ways for a safe harbor, if you will, a grace period. If, if you pay everything within the 30 days, you can't be sued for anything. If you pay the claim, which would be the overdue benefit, you can't be sued for attorney's fees, 
but it has to be paid within the 30 days after the demand letter, correct? Correct. And there's no other safe harbor in 736, correct? Correct. Okay. Ex and right. what, is, what is unclear about the language, any dispute? Well, there's nothing, it, it, it's not so much unclear, it's that 627736 does not give rise to an independent basis for attorney's fees. It simply says that you, you can seek fees under 627428 under the terms of that. And you necessarily then have to be entitled to attorney's fees under 428 uh, in, in order to be awarded them. And 428 requires that the litigation be over a, a, a policy or contract. And that's what the trial judge said in the first order, first judgment, that the interest was owed pursuant to three statutes and the contract, the policy, right? Um, correct, but didn't, did not say where in the policy. And as I read it, I honestly think, Judge, that she was referring to the fact that they're overdue and subject to interest under the 30-day provision that is in the policy. That's the only thing that's in the policy. Right, and I'll, I'll just do the two-second, and you could have appealed that. Mm -hmm. You didn't. You, you dismissed it. You could have said, there's nothing in the policy that requires that you got that wrong. Right, but then it wouldn't have been grounds for reversal of the 5503 judgment which is the, the only judgment that would have been before the court. We, there would have been no point in appealing something saying we don't want a reversal, but we want you to correct this excess language that the trial court included in there. It wouldn't except, have made any except sense. Except under 428, if the recovery is based upon the policy, which the trial judge here said it was in part, then under 428 and 736.10, the insured or the assignee is entitled to fees. Except that the, that, that portion of the judgment that addressed entitlement was non-final and was subject to being reconsidered, which is ultimately what happened. I agree, but the, the finding that the court finds plaintiff is owed $1.48 pursuant to the three statutes and the policy of insurance brings you into 428, doesn't it? I, I hesitate to repeat myself, but then w if we weren't contesting $1.48, if we were not contesting 5503 and how to calculate to $1.48, what but if the real what boogie, would we, if, if what the would we have appealed? If the man that you were really fighting against was against attorney's fees, it would have been worth your while to say we're not under 428. And if we had come before the court and said we don't want a reversal, we just want you to fix this, would the court have done that? Would there have been any purpose to it other than a hypothetical argument that might be made in the future that this uh, excess verbiage might be deemed law of the case insofar as whether or not the interest um, was chargeable under the policy or contract. It, it, it really was an untenable situation, and certainly I think that had we done that, it, the court may very well have thrown us out of court because there's no point in appealing something when you don't want a reversal. Because if you had shown up for oral argument in that first case and we said, what about 5503, and you said, yeah, it applies, that'd be a basis to affirm right then and there without even consideration Correct. of the other issue. There, this court wouldn't have done anything different. It still would have been law of the case and nothing would have changed. So it, it, it really was kind of a hollow, uh, hollow argument to say, well, you could have appealed it, but you didn't. It's, it's a little bit m more complex than that. Um, if I could just clarify, the, the contract doesn't mention interest. Correct. correct. Right. So, I mean, the contract and policy is all about getting benefits, correct? Correct. Okay. So, in my mind, I'm, what I'm struggling with is I think the legislature clearly would say you're entitled to fees and interest and so forth when you get a benefit, but I don't see any clear indication that the legislature intended to provide for recovery 
of attorney's fees to litigate this minuscule amount of, of interest. I, I agree. I don't think that the legislature did intend. I mean, if the legislature were watching today and said, uh, there's the fifth DCA and they're arguing over a case involving $1.48 worth of interest and there's tens of thousands of dollars of attorney's fees on it, I, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to think that that's what the legislature really envisioned. And on the flip side of the coin is, well, uh, 627, 428 says what it says, and we're going to strictly apply it. And if it's a judgment, then it doesn't matter what it's for. If it, come, if it rises out of the litigation, tough luck, you have to pay an attorney's fee. So I'm struggling with that purpose versus strict, literal application of the statute. Maybe you could help me. Well, I think they can be harmonized. Um, the strict construction uh, would require the court to determine whether or not the recovery was had under a policy of insurance. Um, and if it is not, and it clearly is not here because interest is not contemplated in the policy, it's solely a matter of statute, um, then under strict construction, it's not recoverable. Um, so, I, I, and, and, you know, as, as uh, the court said in uh, the Liberty versus Pan Am, this is, you know, this is really, um, something that the legislature could not possibly have contemplated and, and undoubtedly um, would not want uh, to happen. In, in but that's looking behind the statute. If we're supposed to read the statute, if it's clear and unambiguous, and I don't see any ambiguity in any dispute, that, that language to me is about as broad, I mean, I guess you could say any and every. I don't know if that adds anything, but uh, not that I think it's a wise policy decision, but in terms of the clear language of the statute, it says any dispute, and even if you look back at 428, it says under the policy. It doesn't say and receives benefits under the policy, does it? Cor well, that's correct, but I don't think that it's necessarily about benefits or not benefits. It's what's uh, recoverable under the policy. In some instances, it could be a defense, for example, that's something, a dispute under the policy. But the bottom line is it, that there's no language in either of those statutes that would warrant an attorney's fee award for statutory interest, postage, or penalties. And if the, if the legislature had wanted to include that, it absolutely could have included it. it could. If they wanted to exclude it, they could have, and they didn't. Well, that's correct, but there's a lot of things they didn't exclude under either they, of those they, statutes. But. When it comes to attorney's fees, they, they did create a safe harbor. They did exclude it. If you paid it late and paid the claim, even if you didn't pay the postage, the penalty, or the interest, if you'd paid the 168 bucks within the 30 days after receipt of the demand letter, you'd be bulletproof. You couldn't be sued for attorney's fees. The legislature could have expanded that. The legislature could have chosen to use words other than any dispute, but that's what we're left with. And I, you know, again, I just don't see the ambiguity. But well, I, I mean, yeah, it, it, there's nothing recoverable under six two seven seven three six without reference to six two seven four two eight. Um, right, and 428 doesn't require a payment of benefits. It just says it has to be under a policy. Under a policy, and if right, this, again, the trial judge could have got it wrong. Well, the bottom line is, is it's not under a policy. All of the cases so far that have dealt with this, and have, they have been out of the Fourth District Court of Appeal, have, have not had any problem reaching the conclusion that the statute has to be um, narrowly construed, strictly construed, and under a contract of insurance means what it says. And, in, and since interest is not under a contract of insurance, it is not recoverable. And I think that the fourth district got it absolutely correct uh, in, in its line of cases. There's no policy, there's no public policy to be served here. Well, it does, it, because you didn't pay the benefit, the $168 in time, you did go, I say you, your client, did go contrary because the whole policy of no fault is to ensure swift, nearly automatic payment, which means 30 days from when it's submitted or at worst, 30 days after the demand letter, that's what swift payment is defined as, and your client didn't make swift payment. So it does encourage swift payment. 
I think it's maybe draconian, it may be unreasonable, but it, it does serve that purpose here, doesn't it? That's correct, and if, if they had sued us on day 32, we probably wouldn't be here right now, but they didn't. And at the time that they, that they sued us, we owed them $1.48. And I, I submit that um, the trial judge was clearly correct in reaching the conclusion that attorney's fees under these circumstances are not recoverable. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let me ask you a couple questions. Uh, I take it from your initial argument that you view the Liberty case as both distinguishable and incorrect. That is correct, Your Honor. Okay. Um, on the distinguishable fact, you know, one thing we've, you know, you've argued, heard argument about is the law of the case aspect. That is the language in the original judgment. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Um, what other facts are distinguishable? And the reason I'm asking this is if, if if facts are distinguishable, then you know, if we rule your way, um, we're not in conflict with the fourth necessarily. But if, but if the relevant material facts are not distinguishable, then we would be in conflict. So besides the law of the case aspect of it, with the language in the trial court's original judgment, um, what are the other distinctions that, that, you're, that you're arguing to the court? The other distinctions that separate this case from the Liberty case is, in that case, if my memory serves me correctly, the provider did not serve a demand letter. They just filed suit. And as, as the uh, concurrence kind of hit on, if somebody would have just asked for the additional money, then you know, somebody with rec uh, common sense would have paid. In this instance, we did do a demand letter. We did fully comply, and we did ask them again, to pay correctly. Uh, so that and in addition, the law of this case, the ruling in this case, because I want to hit on it, in the final judgment, the first final judgment finding that we were enforcing the terms of the policy, Judge Fields held that the interest owed on overdue PIP benefits under the insurance policy are part of the coverage afforded right. and but, the but promise of Swift. Do you agree with me on the, on the law of the case doctrine, the language in a prior judgment has to be necessary to the opinion and, and in this case would it have been sufficient for the trial judge to have negated all that and just said under 5503 um, plaintiffs entitled to $1.48? I do think that this language was material and, and necessary but as part it, of the analysis. Well would 5503 end the case on, on the $1.48? Not on its own. Because the question then becomes, how did you get to 5503? Well, and you have $168. Well, there's two, there's two avenues to get to how to calculate the interest. One avenue is under the policy of insurance. If it doesn't specify a rate, then 687.01 directs us to 5503 on how to calculate. That's how it explains how we get there under contractual analysis. But even if you didn't have that, it, you wouldn't even have to go to 687. If, if, the, if, you owed if it was already agreed $160 was overdue, not paid, you could go directly to 5503 and calculate the interest, right? Absolutely, but you have to find out how, because if there's nothing in the policy language that says this is how you calculate the interest, then the legislature gave us the tool of 60, uh, 68701 to direct us on how to do that. The only other thing I would add is this court has held you don't have to obtain a PIP benefit in order to, for 428 to apply, specifically in Katsuma when the insurer filed a deck action trying to say there's material misrep and then they ultimately extended coverage, just defense coverage. This court held that 428 applies purely under the contract and that 428, the legislature knows how to provide exclusions. They added one just this last December by adding subparagraph four that it doesn't apply to residential. There's no such exclusion as set forth by what the appellee is arguing here today or as set forth by the fourth DCA. I see my time is over, Your Honor, so I apologize. Thank you. Very interesting, well argued, thank you. <laughs>